No. Hold the microphone over here while I was slurping on my mouth. <laughs> Okay. Ready? All right, ahoy there. Uh, this is a primer for the modern pirate. Uh, we are Project Gunsway. Uh, where every day is talk like a pirate day. So by, by a show of your best, talking like a pirate are, who here likes computers and pirates? <laughs> Excellent. So the next 45 minutes, we will try to pack in as many cheesy pirate memes as you can fit in Davy Jones' locker, which is a lot. But uh, we do have a serious message, so I'll kind of get that out of the way up front too, which is, and I think it's kind of best summarized by like the Captain Phillips quote, um, you know, from the Marisk, Alabama. Uh, they're not here to fish. So we are talking not about what you do with BitTorrent and your in your own privacy, and that's your business. But actual bad guys with guns on the high seas. So bottom line up front is maritime is a critical infrastructure sector. Where there's human life at stake, public safety at stake, and the state of infosec in the maritime sector is immature, to, to put it politely. Bad guys know that and are taking advantage of that already. The good news is all of you are the solution, right? So the InfoSec community, you already have the knowledge and the skills to solve a lot of the problems that the maritime industry is just trying to figure out. So I'm Brian Satira. Um, I'm a volunteer with I Am The Cavalry, um, part of their kind of maritime, fledgling maritime committee. Also Project Gunsway, uh, which is what we'll be presenting on today. By trade, I'm a uh, reverse engineer. I've done malware, ICS, a variety of things. Relevant to this talk, through random, you know, the course of life, um, got to do a number of years ago deeper on uh, some ships for the Navy, ship systems for the Navy, and risk analysis on ship systems for the Navy. Got interested in this sort of focus. Also has some background as kind of an amateur diesel enthusiast. Um, going back to days in the military and more recently working on like sailboat engines, that sort of thing. And you can follow me uh, at, at Redoubt with a three on Twitter. That's also my blog and everything else. Cool. I'm going to use uh, the phone stuff if you don't mind. I'm Brian Olson, a volunteer as well at Project Gunsway. Um, engineer, architect, uh, like dealing with data quite a bit. Uh, past work for the Marines, I did some cool stuff for them down at Quantico. Um, an amateur meteorologist, I like the weather mo or weather routing, weather mapping. I kind of take that over into uh, sailing, whether it's uh, deliveries, you know, I've done Southern Ocean runs, um, as well as a tactician, where I kind of take all the data from the sensors, uh, pull it off the network, manipulate it on my tablet, kind of present it to people so we can uh, get to that finish line at the right angle at the right time based on, you know, what the weather conditions are doing uh, at that current in time. Um, Core Scout uh, information is below. Volunteer organizations. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, I am the Calvary. Uh, Brian is a member. Uh, it's a collective or a group of people in separate areas of research who kind of have that understanding that technology is moving faster than security can keep up with it. Uh, as Project Gunsway, we are kind of a spin-off of that. Uh, we focus on the maritime sector uh, section of it. Uh, our home is DC, Nova Labs, and uh, we do follow, you know, their goals and, uh, you know, their policies, disclosure, and what have you. So my job right now is to kind of give you guys a better understanding of seamanship. 
um, you know, what's out there, what the technology is, and also show you this awesome GIF. Uh, so what's at stake? You know, what's out there, what can go wrong if it is affected? So it's a $19 trillion industry that's out there. Um, there's shipping lanes all over the world. Now 70% of that accounts for uh, developing countries. Uh, that's why, you know, in 2012 with the piracy, all that kind of took place, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, Gulf of Aden, you know, and more recently, you know, it's kind of working its way down to Central America, uh, South America. Um, environment, you know, oil spills, whether it's, you know, an oil tanker or oil platform, I mean, that's always a cause for concern. Uh, human life, uh, being held for ransom, whether it's, you know, on the ship itself or at port, um, with the crew being held at port so the ship's not able to get to where it needs to go to deliver those goods as necessary. Uh, there are regulations that are out there. However, it's, it's to be honest with you, it's a joke. They're, they're different everywhere you go. Every country has kind of got a different regulation. Uh, they focus on different things. Um, you know, physical security is obviously a big one with the ports. Uh, cyber security is just a, you know, an afterthought. Uh, they are trying to change that mentality. Uh, the Coast Guard is trying to do that. Um, however, it's, it's all basic stuff. All right, they're putting out these, you know, documents or recommendations, but such as, you know, don't share removable media. You know, do you, have you trained it? Have you been trained in this operator, this system? Um, what's that? Have you been trained in the system? Make sure the right people have access to what they need to have access to. So it's basic, basic stuff. So what are these vessels that are out there? Uh, what do they do? Uh, we're going to focus on kind of container technology. Um, big ship, all the, again, all this information is freely available online if you, you know, want to poke around and take a look at it. Um, the Emma Marisk, uh, one of the bigger ships that are out there, uh, 1300 feet long, uh, carries 11,000 TEU or those 20, uh, foot equivalent units or those 20 foot trailers that you generally see floating around. Now, when they're loading this ship, these ships up with these units, uh, you gotta keep in mind that they're there for maybe a day, two days tops, offload and load. So there's, a lot, a lot of things are dependent on making sure that the systems in, at the dock are on point and ready to go so that they can get in and out as quickly as possible. Now, if they're doing uh, perishable foods, they're there for maybe a day, day tops. Uh, so moving on from that, uh, these, the current E-Class ships is what we showed you in the previous slide. Uh, there is the timeline uh, based on Rolls-Royce to kind of roll out uh, autonomous shipping. Uh, they hope by 2020, that there'll be, you know, some ships out there for research, you know, get them out there autonomously moving through the waterways. Um, one cause for that, or the biggest cause for that is that the crew and the fuel is the basic, biz, biggest expense uh, for these uh, ship, ships in general. So $50,000 $50, per day to operate, uh, crews are generally 15 or, or less. So the systems that are on the ship, um, we're going to start with the cargo management, a smart cargo, communication at effect. Uh, the communications, you know, have your ship land, your uh, satellite system, ship to shore. So all this data is being sent to HQ on shore. Uh, there's safety, your VTS, which is going to be your AIS, is going to be your tracking. Ship, your information as well as other ships' information is going to be, you know, transmitted through that. Uh, your radar, you know, weather and just, you know, when it's dark out, what have you. Um, your radar is basically how you steer the ship. Uh, propulsion and power, whether it's going to be the engine itself or the generators that are on board, uh, to power everything, lights, etc. Um, and then your navigation is going to be your ectus. Uh, it's basically where your chart display is. And that kind of ties in all that information together. So when you're looking at a chart, you're going to be able to pull up um, all the information or all the data that I just uh, uh, referenced and went through. So the maritime protocols, right? So we see all that data flowing through a ship. Um, you know, this is what it basically is. So it's a NEMA network uh, for your sensors and, you know, some of the controllers that are out there. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, if you uh, open up uh, packets in a hex editor, that's basically what it looks like, right? It's time stamped, um, generally eight, eight bits in length or data length, and then the, the can field data. Uh, for example, like if you are, have a sensor that's sitting in a fuel tank, it'll let you know how much fuel is in there, how long you've got till it's going to be empty. A battery, you know what the juice is on there, how far away is it from 100%, how long does it need to be charged, uh, that type of data is kind of moving around. Um, it is transferred into uh, TCP IP um, later on, we'll get through that, uh, but you have the Modbus TCP IP, 
as well as your uh, serial interface. So ship as an ICS. So you'll see to the right, uh, based on the previous slide, that's what we talked about. So your, your NEMA 183 is going to be your basic, basic functionality. It's a one-way communication. There's no crosstalk between the devices. So you're going to have, you know, something like a compass, right? It's just spitting out information up to wherever it needs to go. Uh, NEMA 2000, again, uh, is going to be your link into everything. Um, it's going to be your CAN network just like the uh, NEMA 183. Those are going to be, again, your field devices and sensors. Uh, you're going to see a gateway level in the middle there. And basically what that level is, suppo is supposed to do, or what it does do, is that it takes that information, that CAN bus, and it just basically encapsulates it so it can be routable via you know, TCP IP. It's like we sent up to your HMI, your human uh, machine interfaces, uh, your Windows boxes, your databases that are up there storing all that data, um, and uh, you know, some of the ECTUS charts and other systems that are found on the bridge for you. Uh, if you take a look at the picture at the top, that's an example of what I use as a gateway, what I pull data off of. Um, I literally plug it into the NEMA network, which is the uh, image on the bottom here. Um, it takes that data, it encapsulates it, uh, spins up a server, I connect to that server, and I'm able to pull all of that information out uh, wirelessly uh, on my laptop, manipulate it, and do what I need to do to... Um, track that data. So smart cargo. Um, there's a wide variety of tech. Uh, nothing is standard uh, in this aspect, which is kind of goes across across the realm in this industry. Um, it's, you know, you'll have uh, sensors sitting in with the cargo. So our example here is, you know, uh, the banana monitoring. Uh, so there's sensors in there that are monitoring the air quality, freshness of the bananas. Um, those report, you know, wirelessly uh, to a station, you know, found on the ship. That is then dumped to a database. There are people monitoring that information. All of that information is then sent shoreside, right? Because HQ wants to know what's going on. They want to know that their product's getting to where it needs to be, in a, you know, so it's going to be fresh when it gets there. Um, all that stuff is able to be monitored, again, shoreside. They send all that data out. At effect. So this is the main line of communication uh, across, you know, multi-country, multi-industry. It was developed in the 1960s. Um, this is how they do business, right? This is how they do business today. Uh, when you're pulling into a, a port, if you want to have load planning, uh, handling instructions, what type of cargo is it, where that cargo is going to go on the ship, uh, this is the mechanism that you're going to use to pull that data down. So you're going to end up gathering that information via email, it's going to be transferred via email, uh, website, HTTP, FTP, FXML. You know, you're able to pull that down to your system, take a look at it, track it, and do what you need to do uh, to make sure everything is where it needs to be. Communications, uh, GPS. So a lot of companies today, Immersat, uh, one of the bigger ones that are out there, uh, they pride themselves on knowing that it's an always-on connection. Right, so what does that mean? That means that as an owner of a fleet, I know where my ships are at all times, what the position is, and what the conditions are uh, on that ship. So these also provide internet access uh, for emailing, calls, and telemedicine is actually a, a, a newer one that came out, where basically if someone gets injured on a boat, you know, I'm able to monitor what they're doing or how they are you know, on that ship, the life support. Again, all of this stuff like that is being sent shoreside. Um, I'm able to operate equipment on that ship remotely. I'm also able to update that equipment remotely if, I, if need be, um, and also relay some other information, uh, some beacon information on um, other assets that are on board on that ship. And the safety and navigation, or your ECTUS, uh, this is going to be your chart plotter, right? So an example of the AIS system or the information that's with that um, is in the top right. And that's going to give you your, your idea of the ship, uh, your heading, how fast you're going, uh, where you are, your name, um, and position. And the bottom screen right here is going to be your chart display. Uh, again, it's going to be your course over ground, uh, your coordinates. Um, the lay of the land, you know, if the buoy's out there, what's it like underwater, what's the depth like, um, 
The radar screen to the right can be overlaid to that. And at night, that is your main way of driving the boat, right? Because you can't see anything at night. You're basically driving by the nav station with the, the charts that you have on and then the radar overlaid for weather. Uh, they are smart ships out there, so all of this can be done wirelessly. If you want to sit there and drive a boat by your iPad, you can do that. I have done that, uh, sitting at a meal, sit, having dinner with a bunch of guys, just driving a boat by an iPad. It's been done before. You know, so wireless technology is out there. Um, is it secure? We'll get into that. <laughs> uh, the ICS on the propulsion system, right? So these engines are massive, mind you. Uh, it's common rail diesel, which means it's a computer. So everything on these ships, I can't stress enough, that it is a computer, right? So there's no manual failover for this. Uh, the side, you'll see it's a three to five story unit. Generally, depending on what you are, or which one it is, um, there's either one or two, you know, uh, engines on there, uh, 12 cylinders, computer for each cylinder, you be able to turn stuff off, turn stuff on, all that health monitoring, like I said, in those messages that are being sent up to the nav station, all that data is being sent up on, uh, for review. And that's where I'm going to leave you. So that's a down and dirty technology that's out there on the ship, and now, Hand it over to the pirate. I'll, uh, take so, so now that we have uh, our sea legs, so to speak, and you guys have a very crash overview from, from Brian, who could probably talk for like four days on this stuff, actually, um, on the ship systems, let's talk about pirate TTPs, so tactics, techniques, and procedures to exploit all of that stuff. Some of this is going to be things that have already been done in the wild. Some of this is going to be stuff that's been done in proof of concept. And at the end, we'll get into the research we're doing. So if we're going to be doing uh, this pirate operation, this pirate mission, we're going to start out like any other red team. So have I, have red teamers here, show of hands, anybody, right? So the first thing you know, you're always going to do is information gathering and reconnaissance. You want to get as much information as you can. So I'm going to call it the five W's of piracy, right? The who, what, when, where, and why. So who, who owns the ship, who operates the ship, who ensures the ship. That's going to be pretty important if we're deciding, do we want to steal cargo? Are we going to try and ransom the crew and the ship, right? Um, we also want to know who, who maintains and supplies the ship. I mean, how many people here have gotten into a network for a target uh, co company or organization through a third-party vendor, right? So all these same types of information are going to be important to you. There's going to be other types of information that we want to get, though, which is, you know, where is the ship now? Where is the ship heading? what cargo is on board, what container is it in, all that sort of stuff. But the first thing we probably want to address is, is the cargo value, valuable enough to steal? Is there another way to get the loot? So like, do we want to really take the risk to begin with? So why take the risk? So let's start there. So at the height of piracy and the sort of uh, Marisk, Alabama era, 2008 to 2012, pirates were getting up to $50 million a month in ransom paid out by insurance companies who were just deciding to pay it. Uh, there was no real effort made at security. Counter piracy was very minimal, um, particularly in hot spots like the Gulf of Aden. Um, but that all changed, right? And you know, post, post 2012, that sort of piracy that many people probably have in their mind of the guy in the AK-47 in the little boat um, became very deadly and a lot less lucrative. And so you know, in 2017, we had fewer than 200 of these pirate attacks internationally, which is a good thing, but there were still 200 of them, and they've changed. They've become a lot more sophisticated, very intelligence-driven um, about stealing cargo, not ransom. So you're not sitting there, um, you know, as Brian was alluded to, alluding to sitting in port for three months waiting to get killed by Navy SEALs. Um, and increasingly, they're actually leveraging, um, you know, si various you can call cyber attacks. I'll get into that. But so let's say that we have something juicy, that we're willing to take the risk, and we've decided to do this. Okay, so how do we start getting this information? Well, OSINT, right? Just like any other red team engagement, we're going to do OSINT. Pay dirt for you if you're going to be a pirate is sites like shipspotting.com, myshiptracker.com. There are all these sites out there for amateur ship watchers that publish the AIS information that Brian, the other Brian was talking about earlier. And you're going to be able to get real-time location, where they are, where they're headed, 
who owns the ship, how it's flagged, what their call sign is on the radio, all the information that you would want to get, all this when and where information about the ship. And then we can pivot from there, right, to gaining additional information about Edifact, you know, like what, what, okay, we know what port they're going to. We can then find out, um, you know, who operates the, the cargo management system for that port, et cetera. So that's step one. Step two, we're going to pivot from the ship tracker sites into myship.com. Again, this is, this is absolute pay dirt if you're going to engage in modern piracy. Basically think of it as the hell spawn of Facebook, LinkedIn, and a bottle of rum, right? <laughs> it's, there's like, you, you can go in, look up any ship you want, find out who the crew are, find out who their shipmates are, and then social engineer the hell out of it, right? And you can get all that information you want for credible phishing emails, for brute forcing their password, their security questions, all that type of stuff that we're going to do with social engineering, and then pivot from there with whatever it is you do, you use Multigo transforms, etc. Just playing around with this, I've found all kinds of stuff. All that information that we want as a pirate. So, uh, moving on, it's all about the booty, right? Um, so, you know, the next step in our, our, our attack is going to be compromising Edifact. Um, if you can gain access to Edifact and the cargo management systems, we can control pretty much everything. What cargo is going to be on what ship, where it's going to be loaded on the ship so we can get access to it. We may not even have to actually go out on the high seas and risk getting killed. We could just pull up in port with a truck, sign for it, and, and drive away. So to go through a couple examples real quick, and I'll start moving here uh, on time, but some of my favorites, so at the, what I would call like the usual suspects Kaiser Sose end of the spectrum, is the Antwerp port heist, which actually went on for about two to three years. They had compromised the cargo management system for the port of Antwerp, which is uh, Seapoint, ne next port is like a CMS framework for it. Uh, it's common to a lot of ports, so that's probably good information to know. Um, they, they basically had physical access and put in kind of like a Hack 5, Pony Express type fake devices and began man in the middling the Edifact traffic. And then from there, they were able to just put drugs and guns into containers in South America and ship them to Belgium, show up with a truck, and drive away. And the only reason they got caught is that there was this big gun battle where one crew of Russian gangsters tried to hijack a, sh a shipment of another crew. And, you know, when you have dead Russian gangsters, gunfire, and, like, a giant 40-foot conics filled with bananas, people tend to notice that. Um, so World Fuel Services is my other favorite. That's more in the Ocean's Eleven end of the spectrum, a little less Kaiser Sose. Bloodless, brilliant. They compromised that effect system, basically ordered a tanker ship full of fuel, to sail to the uh, to the coast of West Africa, showed up, got transferred, sailed away. U.S. government got the bill. They they had compromised and replayed uh, Edifact messages from the GSA. So brilliant. And the one that that you guys are probably more familiar with is like the Verizon report from a couple of years ago, which is more like the the con op we're going to talk through, which is just where they just got the information that they wanted about what cargo is on what ship. So they could get on board, the crew follows SOP, retreats to a safe room, pirates take the cargo and leave, no one gets hurt, they're in and out, and they don't have to worry about, um, you know, ending up like the Maersk Alabama incident. So let's talk about that part, getting on and off the boat, right? This, this is actually one of the really hard parts. I've had the opportunity, haven't done this, haven't done VBSS uh, myself. Maybe there's somebody here who has and can call me out if this is not correct. But what I've been told by people who do do vessel boarding, search and seizures, the Coast Guard up through, I've talked with Tier 1 operators who've taken on ships, and they said this is the dangerous part of the business, right, is, is approaching the ship and trying to get on a moving ship from a tiny little boat or a helicopter. So that's, this is going to be our big challenge. And it's going to start by getting network access. Um, many of you have probably been familiar with, and this is why I put it up here, all of the, SAT, the vulnerable SATCOM terminals with default usernames and passwords. 
and like Shodan trip, Ship Tracker. Anybody been on there or looked at that? Um, you, this is just something I did last week. I found a vulnerable KVH com box with Shodan. All the known CVEs for it, it was vulnerable, um, just like an HTTP log, uh, login, in insecure. It's a lot harder than it was a year or two ago when everybody who was not in Maritime was bragging about how easy it was to hack, hack into these SATCOM terminals. But that's not going to deter us, right? If millions of dollars are at stake, that, that world fuel heist was $17 million and they got away clean. Um, we're just going to do what you guys do as red teamers anyway, which is get into a network and pivot from one segment of an enterprise into another segment, some other VLAN. It's just in this case, that first segment is on shore and the other segment is on a ship. And a good way to do that is to bridge the air gap by compromising a crew member's cell phone or laptop or, you know, PED so that they bridge the air gap for us, bring it onto that ship network, right? Mo you know, MDM. So physical access, uh, the approach, um, without getting into all the trigonometry, like you can see really far at sea and here's an online calculator. You just take your, your height and feet, multiply it times one and a half, take the square root of that and you get like your nautical miles distance. So, and this is picture at the bottom of Brian up here. I have no idea how, how high he actually is off the deck, probably more than 15 feet, I'm guessing. But if it was just 15 feet above the waves, he could still see 18 miles up on the mast of that sailboat if he's looking for, you know, a tall, big vessel. And radar range for radar visibility is going to be even greater. So we've got to kind of blind that stuff, and we've got to find a way to compromise, like, the FLIR and thermal cameras that they have mounted on the mast, part of the vessel traffic system, all that stuff that Brian was talking about earlier. And the key to it, which he kind of alluded to, is that all this sensor data is going into the nav computer and other bridge systems, but it's going through these gateway devices or serial converters. And all of that stuff has been demonstrated before tons of times uh, to be, you know, to be ownable. Um, some people might be familiar with like the Moxa endport uh, equipment because it was part of the Ukraine power grid attacks. And Pentest partners have, have, have written about other systems without naming them, but have done surveys and said there's like the top 20 of these basically are all vulnerable. And of course, AIS has been long since owned by different researchers. Um, Balduzzi from Trend Micro kind of started that. Um, but other stuff has been done. Like you can inject fake messages into AIS to the ship you're targeting as well and tell them, hey, there's like a naval exercise going on and if you go that way, you're gonna be in the impact zone for a missile test or whatever. So assuming that we've gotten access, we've injected data into those navigation and bridge systems and compromised all that stuff, um, now we're going to be able to blind them. We're going to be able to make our approach a little bit safer. It's still going to be dangerous, um, but we've still got to figure out a way to control course and speed. And that's because what we want is bare steerage way and a steady course. So again, going back to conversations with ship boarders or if, you know, anybody's familiar with it, um, just look at the picture there. And if you think about that white water, so it looks like that ship's standing still, but you can see the white water on the rigid hull small boat that that boarding team is just doing some training, trying to climb up a ladder. I mean, they're moving, trying to keep pace with that ship. So, and, and that's under a circumstance where there's a compliant vessel letting them train, right? So this is extremely dangerous, extremely difficult if you were trying to do that with a non-compliant vessel with an NCV. Um, so you would really like it if the ship was going as slow as possible. You can't, you don't want it to stop in the water though, which is called dead steerage, because well, basically, that's really dangerous. The boat's moving around. It's bigger than you. What you want is, is bare steerage way. So that's about five to seven knots. And there's, there's no real good way other than through cyber means to kind of, kind of achieve that than anybody's demonstrated. Um, where am I here? So, but one possible way would be, um, with the, again, with the ECTIS and nav computer and playing with the data there because it does monitor how fast the ship is going. You could spoof, spoof some of that data. Um, but a better approach would be if we could actually get access to the propulsion systems themselves. Nobody's really demonstrated that uh, to date or done much publicly on that. And so that's why uh, Project Gunsway, we've kind of focused on that. So just to summarize though before I move on, the CONOPS that we're talking through here, it's OSINT, cargo management system, access, whether that's via corporate network or you know crew member's cell phone, et cetera. And then on to blinding them, so the stealth approach, 
and then controlling course and speed so that we can actually board the ship without getting killed, falling off a ladder. And then uh, I'm the captain, right? And this would just be the alternate pivoting through a third party vendor. Okay, so on to our original research with Project Gunsway. So now we've gone through all this stuff other than propulsion. So our original research has been focused on propulsion for that reason. And specifically, we've looked at the RP-210E and DCU-210E, which are propulsion controllers from Auto Machine. Um, and we also looked at a related Android app, which uh, conveniently enough allows your cell phone to talk to the engines. So why we chose Auto Machine, most people in here maybe never heard of them. However, uh, they're an established vendor in this niche area of maritime and offshore oil and gas. They've been doing it since the 1960s, building SCADA equipment. Um, and more importantly, in recent years, they've become a major supplier up chain in the supply chain from all the OEMs of diesel engines. So Cummins, Caterpillar, Yanmar, Scania, uh, all these organizations just rebrand their equipment and then provide it to end users who may not even be aware of it, right? And one example of that is NOAA. So the National Oceanographic and... Uh, Atmospheric Administration, they had some engine refits with Cummins engines, got supplied this auto machine equipment, the same stuff, more or less, slightly different model, slightly different touchscreen than we were looking at, and we're unaware of it. And just for anybody who wants to know, we are, like I said, we follow the, the cavalry's disclosure policies, and we do ethical disclosure. We've already long since coordinated with NOAA. They've taken whatever mitigation measures they felt was appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so don't worry about that. But I'm bringing it up because, not to embarrass NOAA, NOAA actually had the resources to respond. Most of the organizations in this sector don't have the resources to even do anything with the information if I provided it to them. Uh, so that's where, you know, the InfoSec community's got to step up and help out. Um, and the supply chain complexity is another big problem that, that you have where people don't even know what equipment they're really running. Another good example, though, my favorite, and I'll put this one out, is Marine Pro on a mission for the lulls. Uh, so Auto Machine, this Norwegian company, their defense contractor arm was bragging recently uh, over the past months about how in 2017 a new aircraft carrier launched and was undergoing sea trials using their Marine Pro propulsion systems uh, on the engines. So haven't, I don't know exactly what carrier it is, but based on engine specs, was able to narrow it down somewhat. Probably one of the two in green. And I love the quote from one of their sales managers bragging about how we don't have the biggest button, but it works every time, to which I respond. So this is our lab setup and methodology we call, call Nova Labs in Reston, Virginia, uh, home, same as Nova Hackers and uh, Nova Tool. And we probably should be sponsored by Heavy Seas Brewing. Um, we got to work on that. Yeah. So, um, and... Seriousness, uh, you know, basically we have a tabletop ship, very simple. Um, this is, you know, a volunteer project. We don't have giant budgets. Uh, but we have uh, the RP-210, which is a remote panel that represents a bridge. It's the type of thing you would have on the bridge. And then we have the engine room controller, uh, the engine controller that represents the engine room, connected on this network by Modbus TCP IP. And we've got our, mo our monitoring slash attacker node. And then we've got a crew member's cell phone represented by an Android device running the Marine Pro app that I mentioned earlier um, and or our version of the app, which is special. And uh, there's some of the tools we used. Um, you, you guys are probably familiar and either love them, hate them, whatever. We had to try and find stuff that worked on the platforms we're dealing with. And so a lot of this research, you're probably going to sit there if you guys are like super sophisticated bug hunters and you're used to doing all these crazy rope chains and heap sprays and everything else. All this stuff's awesome, but it's really not necessary. And our focus in this sector, in this domain at this point, and our focus has been on enumeration, not just, or excuse me, on effects, not enumeration. So finding the low-hanging fruit vulnerabilities that have super significant impact so that we can evangelize and get people, the end users, and maybe even the vendors to start caring about baking in security. Because what we found in our research was that they do not bake in security. So, you know, initial findings, we're talking about very low-hanging fruit stuff, all like hard-coded credentials, things in plain text, et cetera, et cetera. These are CVEs that CERT CC has issued us. We have a whole pipeline of vulnerabilities. We just 
it, it comes up faster than we can document stuff and do ethical disclosure. So this is just the stuff that's rolling out um, thanks to CERT CC, I think today or yesterday. I haven't even checked. And, and we've all we've already done ethical disclosure through the maritime and port security, ISAL, et cetera. So I'm not I'm not being that guy. Uh, inside, it's just like the IoT embedded devices that you've probably uh, embedded Linux IoT devices you've probably looked at. Um, running Angstrom Linux, uh, BusyBox tools, super vulnerable version of DropBear SSH, um, for which there are, I think, exploits even in like exploit DB and, you know, for Metasploit framework. Um, and then for the touch screen, this like touch screen framework by these guys in Finland. Um, yeah. Enough said. The, the, the only note I'll put there is that like easy tasks are not so easy for us. So again, if you think we're doing Fisher Price stuff, like this, this system on a module by Calibri, there was nowhere to attach a JTAG header. It had this, like, you know, we had to try and figure out some crazy way. There's like test pads on the back of it. You need like some pogo pins and some sort of special adapter. We don't have that yet. So on chip debugging has not yet happened, but we've been able to look at static code. It's that type of thing. That's why I had to get your own beer, uh, from Captain Ron. Uh, so watching these devices connect to each other, again, it's, Plain text, um, on, you know, unencrypted Modbus TCP IP over port 502. Um, and, uh, you know, starting out with this like custom protocol, if you want to call it that, that they did this handshake where it says in plain text to broadcast, hello world, and you get responses with the firmware, rev, and the device or product model from Auto Machine. And then you're good to go and it'll let, it'll accept any Modbus stuff you send to it. And so that's what we did. So we did dex to we did dex to jar on the uh, on the APK for the the um, Android app, and realized that their version of security was saying, well, we only pull data and display it, right? So we're not sending commands, so nobody can abuse this. I except that, of course, we just wrote our own version that sends commands, and specifically our little proof of concept version called Meritrojan that one of our our colleagues who is not here today. Uh, cause he's West Coast, um, wrote, except an SMS command. So simulating that, that crew member who's out on the ship, right? And we've got to bridge the air gap. We send him an SMS text message to the, the Meritrojan on his phone. And then it sends the Modbus command to flip the coil bit to turn off the engine for us. And you might say, oh, but how are you, how is it going to connect to the engine? Well, if you look down at the bottom right hand, uh, the bottom right hand corner of the screen, that's a rebranded TP Link Wi Fi router that Auto Machine is kind enough to sell as an accessory to plug into their engine controllers. And of course, you know, moving on, there is a secure Modbus for people who are not aware. It just came out this summer, so implement it. Uh, embedded, again, like I said, all the embedded, the lousy, lousy security embedded Linux IoT devices you've pwned probably like way more times than me. Same type of stuff that you see there. Same stuff we saw with like Brickerbot and all that sort of thing. Um, where you have the vulnerable, vulnerable drop bear SSH with hard coded credentials for root. Um, this password am root all lowercase. Here's the RSA key if you want to go looking for these things on Punk Spider or Shodan. Although Punk Spider is now, I, but since I wrote these slides, Punk Spider is now down. Uh, hopefully not for the count. If anybody else is also a fan of Punk Spider as an alternative for Shodan, please bug, uh, Alex from Hyperion Gray. He was funding it out of his own money as a completely free alternative and nobody was donating. Sorry, I just had to throw that plug in for him. Um, cause it's a good, it was a good, cool product where you could do a lot of stuff without a pay API key. And, uh, yeah, so, and of course, again, right? What, what vulnerable Linux IoT device would be complete without a vulnerable embedded, embedded web server? And this one was really, really fun. Um, you know, running Google Skipfish, I accidentally changed some sort of voltage settings and like caused alarms to go off and the engines to shut down. Um, still haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, and trying to repeat it, but, um, it has, you know, pre-off, uh, file upload. It also has post-off file upload of firmware updates and will execute the binaries for you. And like, you probably can't see it. This is kind of an eye chart on the screen this size, but, um, the bash script that does the checking just uses the built-in gun zip check to see if it inflated properly. Like that's, that's it. And, um, you know, if you forget your password, which is just a four digit, uh, numeric pin, it'll prompt you that that's the right thing to enter a four digit numeric pin. It'll also prompt you with the correct username if you get that wrong. 
And if you put in the wrong four-digit numeric pin, it'll give you a five-digit numeric pin based on that four-digit numeric pin. And it, you can take that in email auto machine, and the guys in Norway will send you back the correct pin. Um, and if, if you didn't just want to sniff the traffic, which is unencrypted, of the authentication, uh, you could do what we did, which is throw the firmware binary in Binary Ninja, which, again, I'm not trying to give people plugs, but free version of IDA Pro, I couldn't, couldn't get uh, Binary Ninja, or couldn't get it to, to run the firmware binary. Binary Ninja took it like a champ um, and was able to find the algorithm that calculates the five-digit pin, so you could just create a decoder. Um, so looking forward, um, I don't know where we're at on time here, but... Uh, looking forward, so yeah, we would like to look at other auto machine, other auto machine products. We'd like to look at the HMI software, the Marine View um, HMI software that does the vessel management. We'd look to, like to look at their serial converters or gateways that are called Rios. Um, but we'd also like and and finish some of the proof of concept work we've got going on right now with like engine overspeed proof of concept. So there's an engine overspeed alert alarm test. And we we're using that essentially to um, act as a limiter on the engines so that we can simply set the set point instead of being 90% of what's safe at, say, like 40% of what's safe and get the engines to not be able to exceed bare steerage weight going back to that propulsion problem, right? So that's, that's going to be the money. And the, you know, we would also, of course, like to, uh, to look at other equipment that's just a little bit harder to get your hands on. Um, you know, a little bit harder, and they start asking those questions about where's your shipyard. Um, but anybody who knows a ship that has like BMW engines, that like the ones that Brian showed, or Kongsberg uh, equipment or Wurzela equipment, we would be happy to come look at that stuff. So, in conclusion, um, you know, with the auto machine stuff, it's ongoing. It's a lot of low hanging fruit, but it affects a lot of people who are unwitting end users because of supply chain. And they're very reminiscent of the type of vulnerable IoT devices we've seen uh, get taken advantage of by things like Brickerbot. And, you know, in general, the maritime sector, the, the InfoSec state of things is very immature. A lot of low-hanging fr uh, low fruit, but they're low-hanging fruit with a lot of um, serious consequences. And you have to start somewhere. And the good news is that all of you out there in the InfoSec community, even if you don't have any background in maritime, the way... I, I do it to a lesser extent, and Brian does to a, to a large extent, um, you already have a lot of the answers that they need. You already have a lot of the skills and the knowledge that would really go a long way to securing this critical infrastructure sector. And so I'd really encourage you, uh, if you're not involved and you have the skills and the interest, to get involved with, you know, I Am The Cavalry, reach out to I Am The Cavalry, uh, with Bo and Josh and, and Klaus and everybody, the whole gang, there's a couple hundred of us. Um, or reach out to us if you're specifically, you know, specifically for the maritime stuff, um, particularly if you're in the D.C. area, but even remote, uh, with our project Gunsway. Um, follow us on Twitter, you know, send us an email, and, you know, be like Sloth, be a hero, right? So, and these are some of the folks we would like to thank who've kind of helped us out on various things, um, you know, especially all the people who've done the coordinate, you know, obviously uh, uh, DerbyCon and the whole DerbyCon uh, crew. And, uh, you know, definitely all the folks who've helped us with ethical disclosure from U.S. CERT to Norway CERT to MPSI SAL. Um, and I think we have, like, probably, like, five minutes or something left to uh, take some questions. Okay. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? In the back? No, so we didn't. So we just wanted to talk about the concept of GPS or the satellite link as a whole, uh, just because that technology has been, you know, exploited previously. Uh, but no, we haven't taken a look at any of the new technology for communication. Yeah, I mean, not yeah, not individually. I don't know if anyone else has in terms of proof of concept. But. Any other questions? Yep, in the blue. Yeah. So, okay, so I did work previously in the past with NAVC for the Navy. I've looked at whole mechanical electrical systems, navigation systems, all that stuff on Navy vessels. I really can't, 
I don't even want to go there. Not with a 20 foot pole. Um, yeah, I just maybe if Brian has some thoughts, but so, I, I'm so, not. I, I would rather not even. So publicly, it's it's very hard to spoof like GPS wise, right? Uh, because there's backups on backups. Uh, so it's gonna like come down the, the nature of being out the, the, in, in the in you know the ocean. The nav the nav computers have you know on even commercial ships. So when you take it commercial realm, have complex like um, PID loop algorithms and all that sort of thing. And they take multiple inputs and decide what's a good input, what's not a good input, and all of that. The University of Texas has demonstrated, you know, and others have demonstrated before that you can fly a UAV over a ship and take it off course. It's not really that simple in the real world, but as we just showed, if you were like an advanced persistent threat actor and you're going to take the time to get onto the corporate networks and then onto the ship networks, you can just do what pen test partners and all sorts of other people, Cisco Talos or Talos and all these people have demonstrated, which is compromise the serial converters, spoof all of that serial input to the nav computers. The nav computers are just a Windows box running like XP embedded, literally uh, XP embedded. Think like service pack zero um, with a bunch of custom kernel drivers for things like X-band radar that break all the time. Um, really fragile systems, really easy to exploit if you get access. So there are other ways that one could do something like that, um, but I would rather not comment on the, the Navy stuff. So uh, to touch on what you or were talking about with the Texas State study, um, AIS was uh, what they used to uh, predict a ship and make it uh, look like it was off course. Yeah. yeah. It's in the, uh, not the, the UN University of Texas. Yeah. They, they also did uh, a Navy study. Yeah. Anyway. So if I were anything that I'd look into AIS. Yeah, I mean, AI, owning AIS gets you a lot, as we said before. Um, Pentest Partners has done some interesting work on that. So again, we're focused on propulsion, specifically because there ha it hasn't been explored, explored very much, um, and because we both know a little something about like marine diesel engines and that sort of thing. There's been tons of work already done on AIS and ECTIS and all the stuff that goes into the nav computers. That's been pretty well explored, right? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Well, we we thank you for, for joining us. And if you enjoyed it, just give me a final R. R. <laughs> Outstanding. Yes. Yep.